endoscopy in the stomach using robot pills. We've shown that you can get high quality imagery. Recently with NaviCam, we've shown that you can actually use magnetic fields to start moving these around and create an active device, right? This is an amazing time to be alive. And to me as an aerospace engineer, I think it's an amazing time to be at DDW. Because what we're basically creating is a little robotic eyeball uh, that can actually swim in your stomach over a Zoom call. And so our differentiation that we're really trying to offer here uh, is basically uh, a little robot pill with lithium batteries and electric motors and pump jets. Right now, we actually control it uh, using, uh, using Xbox controllers, of all things. I, I, think, I think we're probably moving in the direction of just letting a doctor on a smartphone with an app on their phone do a basic inspection of the stomach. Uh, I, I also think that while we're witnessing the revolution of artificial intelligence, uh, we also have an opportunity uh, to let doctors take a step back. You know, first, let's put the best doctor in the world right into your living room, right into your stomach, right? But once we've done that, once we've had the best doctors in the world controlling these, you know, uh, annotating the imagery, I think over time we can take the world's collective intelligence and combine it. And we can let AI start to let these robot pills swim around in your stomach. And so what I envision here with my team, we're based in Silicon Valley, what I envision uh, is basically basically a completely new deal Excuse on me, George, uh, Are you okay if we stop so we can get your slides up then? And we'll stop yeah. the timer too. Oh, you're, no you're, problem. You're doing phenomenal without any slides. So. <laughs> no, no. Don't worry. The Achilles heel of every meeting I've ever been to is AV. Give me a company that is good AV. <laughs> well, how about we puff up DDW for one second? Uh, one of the neat things is that we have a booth, right? And we've been letting people come by and grab the Xbox controller. And if anyone in this room has actually managed to control it, you know, while you've been here at the event, you probably saw the thing flip flopping around in the fish tank. You probably saw not that great of video quality, right? This is a project that is underway, but to be here at DDW. Uh, among the world's leading gastroenterologists and in this community is pretty incredible because honestly, I think we're maybe three months from a stable platform, maybe one month from high quality video, right? We are here to collaborate. And that doesn't just mean to, to compete with other endoscope makers, right? We're actually inviting Navicam to come and show us their technology while we show them our technology because this is the kind of place where we can work together. I think this is the kind of place where we can show patients all around the world. There is a new kind of medicine, right? A new kind of a deal. And uh, you know, if we do manage to get some slides up, I can't wait to show you these. Uh, <laughs> it's time for a commercial break. Yeah. <laughs> and, and while we're uh, while we're waiting here, um, the reference to. 1997 and that first suggestion was um, very reminiscent. Uh, I, I was uh, one of the first employees in, in the US for, for given imaging. And it was so, in some ways it was a technology that was 15, 20 years before its time. Really, uh, you know, where it is today and what it's done more importantly to patients. Um, you know, being able to see a part of the anatomy that we were never able to see.
So, so of course, it's nothing like a high-tech shark tank to have uh, a, a, a fail of uh, our own AV. This, this is uh, nothing that I think we should hold against the team here. Uh, but we will just hang on here. Well, you know, this definitely, it definitely raises an important question, right? Is if we're going to put robot pills in your body and control it from the other side of the planet, what does our IT staff look like? Right? For example, <laughs> is this going to happen on every patient? <laughs> All right, clock is back on. Awesome. Okay, folks, so uh, let's, uh, let's get the clock going, and we're going to finish on seven so we can do some q and right? So the, the basic question here is, why are we doing this? Why are we swallowing robot pills? And the, the basic idea is, you know, if you ask the docs in this room, you have access to the world's best tools, the world's best clinics. Let's go talk to some patients, though, right? There are patients out there that are trying to get their procedures, you know, agreed upon by the insurance. Uh, there are patients that go to the hospital a bunch of times before they finally get a procedure. Th and the thing that's a little frustrating is, let's say you have gastritis. You know, I have a friend, uh, I, I won't reveal her name, but you know, she went to the hospital six times to get the gastritis diagnosis. And you know, in five minutes of looking around, they were able to see it. So let's front load that five minutes. And it costs us about 35 bucks to make this robot. And it costs us about 15 bucks to make the little dongle that goes with it. That's the entire system. Uh, yeah, so here's PillBot. Um, you're looking at a 12 millimeter version of PillBot. Uh, I'm actually holding a 13 in my hand. We, we put a bigger battery so we can have a little bit more fun here for the demos. Uh, so this is always evolving. Uh, but I'd like you to think of PillBot as a moving eyeball for the human stomach. I'd, I'd like you to think of it as our attempt to create the world's first virtual endoscope. And I really hope you see it as the beginning of an adventure. You know, people ask us hard questions, you know, is this going to be as good as an endoscope? And we have to say, no, <laughs> you know, this is probably the world's worst endoscope. It's just the world's first virtual endoscope. Uh, so let's look at some differentiation here, right? Because we are here in the presence of uh, pill camp and we are seeing artificial intelligence. We're seeing partnership with Amazon bring pill cameras from swallow at home, or rather swallow in the hospital to swallow at home. It's amazing. Uh, we're looking at magnetic actuation of pill cameras. Uh, that maybe use a little bit of capital equipment, like tie you to the hospital. And then really the gold standard, which is an endoscope, right? We can look inside, we can fix what's wrong. Our goal is to try to look at millions of patients where a quick look inside their stomachs would have some value. And so zooming in on the actual mechanisms here, uh, it, this is kind of fun. We're kind of like a, the mullet of medical robotics. There's a pill camera in front and the legs are in back, right? So you've got a, a camera, you have some LEDs, that's very pill camera-esque. Then we go to the world of cell phones and we borrow those vibrator motors uh, that shake your phone when you get a call. We put a little propeller on it. And right now we have three. Uh, we've tried four pump jets, you know, we're always evolving it. But basically this thing squirts water in any of six different directions to move around inside your stomach if you are willing to drink some water. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, so far I've actually swallowed 15 of these and my personal uh, routine is skip my breakfast, drink some warm water to kind of rinse out some of the goo. By midday, that's when I've got my Zoom call with the venture capitalist, I drink a bunch of water, I swallow the robot and basically swim around for a little bit. All right, here we go. Uh, so we really, really love building robot pills. Uh, we're based in Hayward, California in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, our first prototype here was called Poolbot. It was the size of a football. And uh, it was what we could afford to make at the time. Uh, we went through a, a, an accelerator program, the Founder Institute. We took that uh, prototype into Stanford to watch uh, Dr. Farah Memon's PhD defense when she made an eight millimeter ultrasound pill. We thought that was amazing. Now she works at Butterfly Networks. And we've just systematically been trying to crank this down into something about the size of a pill camera. Um, James is in the audience. He's the one that machines the polycarbonate shells, right? Uh, we are a team of doers that actually makes this stuff. We'd like to think that we've kind of de-risked the mechanical hardware at this point. And really now we're kind of turning into a software company because if anyone has seen our demo, you can tell we need a little bit of self-driving. We need to sort of tame this beast, so to speak. Um, but uh, you know, we have done a cadaver study over at Mayo with, uh, with Dr. Kambari, and uh, we're in the process of growing up. You know, the, this is a pilgrimage of us coming here to DDW because 
Uh, we are hoping that you see us as a Silicon Valley startup that is really trying as hard as possible to put some deep tech into the, the medical tech community. And uh, we just hope there's a, a place for this. And uh, it, it doesn't really matter like how you carve it up. Like if I asked how many endoscopes are sold every year, it, that's a lot of endoscopes, right? And if, if we are a virtual endoscope, maybe we could put some pressure in that market. Or if I ask how many people around the world are getting tubes slid into their bodies, I mean, that's, that's a very large number. And you know, I, I'm not here to, to end the world of endoscopy. I'm just here to get patients into hospitals faster when they really need that advanced care and maybe get millions of these out to the world to, you know, solve the world's belly aches, right? <laughs> let's, let's make it easy when you have these stomach pains to, to figure out what's going on. And moving forward. I'm trying to move forward. Hey, Chris, could you help me move forward? <laughs> so, so we have a market opportunity, I would say. Um, and the question is, you know, is every patient gonna be willing to swallow one of these things, right? And to that, I think the answer would be no. You know, like maybe 5% of patients aren't willing to swallow a pill camera. Ours is a little bigger right now, and so I would expect a higher percentage to, to not be comfortable swallowing it. Mm -hmm. um, but to, if we can make a device that is relevant in a population 25% of the time, that would be quite an opportunity. So our team is working really hard on the execution to simply make this a, a real technology. Okay, so uh, one and a half minutes to go. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. Um, I've been designing med devices for 17 years, and uh, I've, I've been part of three successful exits. Uh, there was vascular closure, therapeutic hypothermia. Uh, that one fizzled out, actually. Atherectomy, cutting plaque out of arteries, endometrial ablation. My team loves to make things. We're, we're very serious. Uh, I think many of us know Viv over at Mayo. Um, he is a hard boss, and we're gonna talk about hard bosses on the next slide. Uh, Alex from Google X. Uh, Chris here, our first Harvard graduate. <laughs> uh, and finally, James and team, right? People actually making these things day in, day out. The scientific advisory board is where <coughs> things get very serious. Uh, because I think at this point we have the attention of the real stakeholders, the people who matter. And what we are trying to do is to create a useful tool that you actually want to use. Okay, so let's give credit to a successful pill bot. That would be awesome, right? A moving eyeball in the stomach, the first virtual endoscope. But where do you go from there, right? Do you use it for targeted drug delivery? Do you do, you do polypectomies? Do you take tissue samples? Do we do, we do lab on a chip? Um, do we go truly into science fiction and make it really small? Do we eventually leave the GI tract, right? You know, these are the questions that, that we start to ask uh, because these are the questions that become relevant if little tiny robots swimming around in the body can be real. And those are the kind of questions that we're actually here to ask you guys. So uh, with that, I'd love to open it up for questions and thank you. Tori, you did perfect three seconds. <laughs> Good job, uh, despite the technical snafus. Um, two related quick questions. One is uh, the mechanism being driven by these propellers. Um, what happens if the bot falls out of the water? Can it swim on land? This is a really good question. We have to start with an empty stomach and then fill it with water. So usually we don't have a big air water interface because we're not injecting gas in the first place. Um, second question is if we do get out of water, what happens? Well, I'll be honest with you, sometimes when we hit an air bubble, we'll suck it into the thrusters and then we get vapor lock. We're kind of working on the surface properties to try to squirt those bubbles out. It's, it's a constant effort. And then the second part of that is, right now it sounds like the limitation is the stomach and you know, other technologies have used tethered ideas of this. And you know, are we able to evaluate anything more than the stomach or you know, can this be brought back into the esophagus or the duodenum? Yeah, so we're looking for a quick, easy win in the sense that we're hoping the stomach is a good beachhead. And the funny thing is, before we really talk about the esophagus and the duodenum, we actually go all the way to the, the colonoscopy space, right? So I've swallowed 15 of these, and I think this is a room where I can be honest. Uh, I've also put three up the other way. <laughs> so you can imagine my chairman duct taping radio to my belly, and we've got a hose, and I guess we know each other pretty well. I think, I think that if you could take a colonic process where you do a bunch of flushes with water, and then administer a pill bot, 
there's a possibility that we could create a walk-in, no-prep colonoscopy. Um, so we're very interested in going beyond, but thank goodness for that stomach, right? Thank you for this very exciting presentation. Uh, I have a conceptual question. What, what problem are we trying to solve here? Is it stomach cancer? Is it, because uh, my fear is if the stomach is not insulated enough, everything can look very different. And of course, we didn't have really because of multiple uh, reasons here. So my, short of, you know, this is an exciting, very exciting project. What, what is the unmet need that we are solving from a disease perspective, not patient comfort perspective? Thank you so much. The thing that really scares me is that when we diagnose stomach cancers, it's, it's often because they become symptomatic. And so if we look at stage three and stage four, that's the kind of thing you would never wish on, on any member of your family, or maybe even beyond, right? And the hope is that if we make this cheap and accessible enough, we will start catching stomach cancers much, much earlier in the progression of that, of that disease. not to show a video, but it seems like that would be the most selling point here. Or uh, was, was it a technical issue, or did you intend to not show? Uh, if you want, uh, during this Q&A time, Chris, if you can play well, this I'm, video. I'm yeah. just curious, yeah, no, no we're not having uh, the videos. Uh, sure, yeah, we, we were trying to keep it uh, uh, within the, the guidelines, um, but uh, everyone is welcome to come by booth 3202 and grab an Xbox controller. We'll, we'll be here for the rest of the event. And just to clarify, you know, you're not, Primarily using this for gastric cancer screening because the, the inclusive uh, point of care assessment is Pepsia bleeding everything, right? Yeah, in layperson's terms, I like to tell people we're trying to you know go after the world's belly aches. Okay. Is this something a physician has to prescribe, or is one direct to consumer? And who's driving this? Because um, who's ordering this? I mean, you mentioned the thirty-five dollar pill, but whose time is going to be spent looking at this? Um, presumably there's a driving component, so that doesn't sound like it's a couple minutes. It sounds like you could spend 30 minutes looking around. Um, so from a human resource issue, how do you anticipate this, particularly this driving component? This, this brings us to the crux of, of the next few years for us, right? Uh, initially, we're trying to create a virtual endoscope, probably a class two device by prescription. However, as the AI models build over time and as trust in AI builds over time, I would love to envision a world where you could pick this up from a pharmacy and it would do an auto scan and, and that you might be able to do it routinely, uh, frequently. Um, but what effect does it have on a practicing GI? You know, what effect does it have on a big clinic or, or a facility like a, 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 an outpatient facility that's privately owned where a lot of the money is made by charging to various codes associated with bringing people through that clinic? We feel that it could potentially be disruptive in certain ways. Uh, if there's any um, thing that might help that, it's that it will take us a little bit of time to perfect it, and it'll take us a little bit of time to get out into the world. And so I'm hoping that this uh, change that it might have on the ecosystem can happen smoothly so we can figure out how to do it right. For the gastroenterologist, um, um, at EGD, you guys can do an EGD in seconds, pretty much. And this doesn't sound like it's going to be for the patient, yes, very convenient, but for you guys, perhaps more time consuming. Do you, uh, obviously you have scanned yourself, you see it's normal, but have you uh, predict, uh, predicted how long it would take for a scan in real life? Sure, when I swallow one of these things, usually I get a good five minutes. Uh, I've, I've piloted for as much as 45 minutes. Ultimately, we're just looking at how long the doctor spends manipulating the endoscope, five, 10, 15 minutes. We're trying to give them a useful tool in that time frame, but it's a one-way pass through the esophagus, and a patient can't dangle it on a cord and get help, right? So it is, it's very much a, like a lightweight attempt at a virtual EGD. Is there any possibility that it might get stuck in the stomach? Well, there is absolutely that possibility, and I can tell you that my team is working very hard to attempt to mimic the same basic size, shape, and geometry of the various capsules out there in the world, uh, and I'm hoping that we can draw an equivalency, if not better. There are 30 seconds left. You guys got any <laughs> no 30 second question. <laughs> Sharks. 
Thank you very much.